As you could certainly see and hear, we are not selling anything. Otherwise, we probably would have a different acronym and a different name. Our association was founded in 1968 on June 7, and it was actually founded in Stockholm, as I discovered recently. At that time, the Association of the European Economic Communities Association and one of EFTA, of which Sweden was still part. When it comes to cancer, it's obvious. We have made tremendous progress. Actually, over the last few days, I read Hans Rosling's book, Factfulness, and discovered that the Swedish uh, population is much better educated than the rest of the world, but in terms of knowing about progress made, not that much better. We by and large underestimate how much better off we are today. And when you look at cancer care, I think one of the biggest changes over the last 20 years was the ability to make many cancers from a deadly disease to a chronic disease. And what we had heard uh, from Arnie, I think, reflects what we see still in many parts, for instance, of Africa. Today, HIV AIDS, people know there's no cure, but it can be treated. And whereas in 2002, we had about 4,000 patients on antiviral treatments in sub-Saharan Africa, it's now more than 20 million. And that there has been an amazing difference, whereas now the problem is when you're diagnosed with cancer in Kenya, or Tanzania, Burundi, most of the countries, you're stigmatized because you know most of times the cancer is far too advanced, as we heard. Even access to palliative treatments like opioids is difficult, let alone the cutting-edge treatments like trastuzumab, which was in, uh, in the slide shown before. Whereas in Western countries we know, we do have a reasonable chance, nowhere bigger than in childhood, for instance, childhood leukemia, today way above 90% cure, not just treatment. This will continue to change because uh, we today have in no other therapeutic area as many research projects, as many products in development, more than 1,900 drugs in development in cancer, the challenge, of course, is cancer is not one disease. I recall when I had a discussion with Carrie Adams from UICC that will say something about the partnerships which we at IFPMA and Access Accelerated enter into UICC. I asked him about his learning cities. Now, on which cancers are you focusing? On one of the big ones? And basically the answer was cancer center. Now, we all know whether it's Karolinska, or I'm sure Tata Memoria, Guy's Hospital, or others. We have, in the industrialized world, a specialist, not just on breast cancer, but in a certain type of breast cancer, or a specialist in gastric cancer. In many countries, of course, the problem is that you don't have healthcare workers specialized. The problem, and that's why I very much welcomed the presentation by Arnie before, the challenge is we most of the times, and I'm sure, and I have no problem at all, we will talk about the cost and price of cancer drugs, and I'm willing to talk about the cost and price of cancer drugs, but unless we are able to make progress holistically, unless that we are able to raise awareness, to talk about screening, to talk about the labs which need to be supplied with specialists. We now have modern digital equipment so that you can do the imaging in one part in Assam and then basically get uh, the reading of the images somewhere in Mumbai or even in New York, unless that we really treat the continuum of care holistically, we will not make real progress.
And therefore, that is something which has to be put on the table. And I'm really intrigued and most interested and most welcome about the big Assam project uh, mentioned. But also, when I look at the numbers, I think right now India spends about 1.4% uh, of GDP uh, on, on healthcare. Modi Care will expand that somewhat. But in most countries, we know even UHC, universal health coverage, may not quite solve the challenge of cancer care. That's why in many countries, from China to the United Arab Emirates, to Ghana, to Kenya, we now see evolving models, and I also see it in India, where you are looking for a combination of how can we get additional funding for this continuum of care, which has to address the weak health systems through not just UHC, because UHC in countries which have 90% of the economy as informal economies will be a challenge. Neither the Bismarck model based on, uh, on insurance, mandatory insurance, nor the keynes beverage model which came into force 70 years ago in 1948 will really give you the money in societies where you have 90% of the economy in the shadow, in informal economies. Therefore, we need to talk about how can we move forward, because in terms of affordability, in terms of the price and cost of it, for people living on a dollar per day, even 20 cents may be too much. We also, having said that, need to look at overall, we have two different worlds. On the one hand, we have industrialized countries, and I spent many hours in Paris over the last 18 months talking to the experts from OECD who are doing a study on sustainable access to innovative medicines. Big question mark, is it sustainable? And quite often, hep C is passed. It is the cost and price of cancer drugs. Now, when you look at the aggregate, the aggregate is actually quite amazing. Overall, in, uh, in industrialized countries, you have between 1% or 2% of healthcare spending spent on cancer drugs. In my country, Switzerland, it's about 2% of healthcare spending, but in the US, in the European Union, it's about 1%. Therefore, notwithstanding the legitimate debate and the questioning and the need to argue the value of new innovative cancer drugs, when you look at the question, is the system going bust because of what's getting on the market? I am an economist, I'm not a doctor, but the system will not go bust if the spending goes up from 1% to 2%. doesn't mean that you can't challenge, that you, need, uh, you can ignore the economies of scale, the life cycle, the importance of generics getting on the market as soon as possible, but the system is not going bust because of that. Also, when you bear in perspective, for instance, again, in my country, we spend about six times as much on tobacco, biggest cause of lung cancer, than we spend on all cancer drugs together, not just on lung cancer. That does not mean that we can ignore the challenge in developing countries, the challenge of improving access to medicines. We cannot fudge the price and cost issue, but we need to operate in a different way. Companies I know are sensitive to the debate. They are willing to explore new reimbursement models, paying for outcomes. They are willing to explore price volume contracts. They are willing to explore service contracts where you not just look at to the last mile, how much does the medicine cost, but actually what can you add in terms of expertise. And one of the big changes which was made over the last 18 months in terms of the industry is that many companies have their individual access programs. You have Novartis, Pfizer, Roche, AstraZeneca, you name it. 18 months ago, 24 companies came
came together, they established an umbrella organization, Access Accelerated, and we now team up with the Un Union for International Cancer Control, UICC, and UICC has launched cancer access prog uh, programs in cities such as Cali, Asuncion, Kumasi, and Yangon. And I'm sure that in the discussion, we will be able to talk more what difference can this make, because even although I'm convinced that the cancer cost is not the problem, the problem is really strengthening health systems, there's no denial that we as an industry, we need to do better and we need to do more, and affordability is one of the ways of doing better and more. Thank you. Please stay. Well, Thomas. Some comments, short comments, questions for Thomas about this. Yes, we have one here. Can you please stand up? Sure. Um, my name's Rebecca. I'm a, a journalist and patient advocate from the States. I was wondering, could you clarify your definition of cancer cost, that 1% figure that you mentioned? So is that including just direct like chemotherapies because I know for me Nulasta was one of the most ex was the most expensive drug I had to get but by it by definition wasn't a cancer drug it was to boost my white blood cell count or tamoxifen or long-term medications that patients may be on so are you counting that and when you talk about cancer spending for pharmaceuticals <coughs> when you look at the cancer drug spending, we talk about all the cancer drugs together, and, uh, and, and that, that's inclusive. It's all together. It's 1% of healthcare spending in the US. Thank you. Okay, Thomas, we'll go on and we'll have a discussion.